Well, we're talking about one of the hardest things about gardening, disease control. Welcome to the Road by Road Gardening Show, the best dead gum gardening show on the internet, where we talk about gardening, a little bit of cooking, and growing your own food. Now sit back and enjoy. Hey y'all, man, our garden's coming in. Ooh, wee. Uh, flowers, of course. And what's this little thing right here? What's so, that lemon drop? Lemon drop. Do you know what these purple ones are? I do. That purple one is Super B Flacilia. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, lemon drop, some few zinnias that um, came up mm -hmm. in the Super B. Yep. Speaking of zinnias, we got a few new zinnias on the site called the Quinny series. We Already got, on the site? Got them on the site. Oh. Yep. So uh, check them out. We just got them in packs right now. It's a new zinnia for us. It hasn't been out very long. Striking colors there. I'm going to grow some. I'm going to plant some probably today or tomorrow. I put some, yesterday I planted, transplanted some sun, uh, sunflowers. Rabbits ate about half of them overnight. It's one of the most frustrating, frustrating things Did for me. Did you put it in your thing where the rabbit fence No, I got the, the sunflower, I mean the sweet potatoes in there. They've been chomping on those. So I, I put a gate up yesterday mm -hmm. there. But they ate half of my sunflowers last night. Oh, no. <clears throat> yep. Well, I've got three baby rats, rabbits. <laughs> I thought they were rats. They're so little um, in my garden. Yeah. You know, a lot of you guys have deer problems, but we have <laughs> rabbit problems here. Yeah. So our rabbits are our, our biggest uh, issue. Oh boy, it can be frustrating me. Normally this time of year I don't have a problem. Normally it's in the falls where I have my biggest issue when I'm transplanting my collards and my cabbage and things like that. But man, they just, I knew they was out there because they'd been eating them with sweet potatoes. But, We've got but, a, a plethora of rabbits this year. We have been. Maggie Jane, our dog, is uh, letting oh, us I down. Know. You know. I know, I was careful. I didn't want her to mess with those baby rabbits. Last yeah, time. conscious about the baby I rabbits. Yeah. So Mama Hoss beat me to the punch this year on tomatoes. I have uh, I picked one tomato that had blossom in rot. Yes, I have blossom in rot as well, and I threw it on the ground. Uh, but Mama Hoss, we have actually ate some of her tomatoes, mm -hmm. and she's done a great job in her raised bed. Now this particular one right here, what's your you're trialing some varieties that we don't carry. Right. Uh, we actually do carry some tomatoes from this particular breeder, but we don't carry these particular varieties. But what is the name of that one? Tie-dye. Yeah. I forgot. Um, pink tie-dye. Pink tie-dye. I think. Yep. It's really unusual color there. And then, uh, these are the pink tomatoes, right? And well, this they're pink, but you see it's got a little blue on there. Mm -hmm. and these are actually the um, blue beauty. And this one, I think, is actually the black beauty. I the black I... beauty is the one that we ate the other day that yeah. was so good. Yeah. I was gonna let you try that one. We haven't tried that one. Now these are more inside. The Blue Beauty are pink, whereas the Black Beauty have a black tint to them. Hmm. Oh, isn't this pretty? Look at that right there. Holy cow. That's beautiful right I should there. should have brought you some bread for a sandwich. Oh, man. Let me get that tough skin off right there. Look at that, folks. That's what we've been waiting on right there. Mm. Beautiful. Put a little salt on that. Hope that's as good as it uh, looks. Looks. Now, some people online, we read some reviews. Some people scrolled these before, and they was complaining about they didn't like the taste of them. Mm -hmm. But taste is subjective to different people. It's a very good tomato to mm -hmm. me. It's got more of a. Now, the Black Beauty didn't have the acidic, but this has more. This tomato acidity mm -hmm. that you. It does. Let me see the plate. I might have to munch on this. Yep. Mmm, that's mm. good. I just want to make a mess all over you. Can you drip? Drip, drip, drip. We got the uh, Halsinator cucumbers coming in. Got a good crop of these right here. And we're going to talk about cucumbers a little bit today. We'll talk about disease control. So one of the most frustrating things and one of the most hardest things to understand is disease control. And one reason is because we make it so difficult. And the reason we make it difficult because it is difficult. Hmm. Got it all that, I believe I like that one better than that light beauty. It's pretty good. 
That'd be mean on two pieces of light bread with some dukes in it. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about diseases. And we're going to talk about not all diseases. We're just going to talk about a few today, some of the most common ones. So the first thing let's talk about is the mildews, the dreaded mildews. And these mildews, which is powdery mildew and downy mildew, are the ones that you're going to face the biggest problem with you with your curbs. And that would be what, Mama Hoss? Squash, Squash. cucumbers, mm -hmm. pumpkins. Did you know watermelons as well? All know. those are, watermelons not so much, but they're still good morning. But cucumbers specifically, and for me, pumpkins is the worst problem I have with downy mildew. You have a picture of this? We do, and we're going to show it up here right now, what downy mildew looks like. Now downy is one of those things when everybody posts a picture on our rubber road group, what's happening to my squash? 99% of the time, it is downy mildew. It starts out with these little yellow spots as you see in the picture right there. And these little yellow spots, one of the key ways to identify this right here is it's not necessarily round. It will be more triangular little yellow spots on that leaf right there. And after they turn yellow, you'll see the spot of the leaf. I can spot downy mildew 200 feet away. It um, it got my uh, winter squash last year. Mm -hmm. I did yep. not make any winter squash. Yep. So uh, we, we see it a lot. After they turn yellow, after that, they'll start turning brown. You'll have these brown margins in your leaves from there. Will and they recover from it? Probably it? not. No, it's very hard to treat the downy mildew. Now, you can prolong it a little bit, The uh, prolong your health that you plant a little bit, but you're not going to control it once they get downy mildew. Once they get downy mildew, you pretty much need to have an exit plan. Okay. So downy mildew is the most common and problematic thing with all your cucumbers, your squash, pumpkins. Now here is the way I counteract that. I plant early. The earlier I plant, the less problems I have with down the mildew. Uh, normally about June or July, first of August is when we really get hit hard with down the mildew. I cannot grow a pumpkin in the fall because of that. And nobody, if you used to draw a line across the state of Georgia around Macon South, can hardly grow a pumpkin in the fall because of this one disease. Now from there, going north, it doesn't seem to be near as bad. Hmm. But um, that's the reason we have How to. How can you prevent it? You can't prevent it. Well, you can do some things to help prevent it, but it is hard to, it's really tough. Um, one thing you can do is keep a good clean garden. So if you got those host plants around the outside, it could be weeds or some things like that. If you keep those down, that'll help somewhat. One of the major things you can do is understand what it is and understand when you need to plant and what varieties you can get by with. Now, for me, the three pumpkin varieties that I know I can be pretty successful with, with heavy down to mildew pressure, is Seminole pumpkin, Cherokee tan pumpkin, and Blue Bayou. Blue Bayou is uh, really powdery mildew resistant. So those, I know if I'm on plant lake, I do that. We also have some varieties of winter squash that uh, are resistant, and some varieties of summer squash that are resistant. And you said this up north, they don't have as big a problem with it? With, with pumpkins, correct. They do have a problem, but not it's not as severe as what we have down here in, in the south. It Is just eats the our lunch, the humidity, yeah. So we have to deal with this all the time. We have to understand it. We have to understand what we have to do to counteract it. So plant early, keep a good clean garden. Now, there is some things you can use to help prevent it. You're a lot better off to help prevent it than you are to try to prevent it. This product right here is probably the most popular one. So the guys that's gonna grow pumpkins in the south southeastern United States, they have to use this product right here, which is chlorothionyl regularly. Now, the the, uh, the farmers, they'll call it paint because this stuff has a white residue to it. And when you spray it on that plant, you're going to see that white residue. Chlorothionyl acts as a protectant, so it protects that leaf from any uh, piercing to infect the plant from that. Works pretty doggone good. It's probably one of the best strategies out there to prevent it. You have to do it every seven days. If it rains, it can wash it off. So you got to stay after it pretty good. We have other products out there that will work. This one, not so much. 
Uh, I think liquid comp works a little bit, and garden foss, I think, has some downy mildew control, and I think liquid comp does as well. So some of those will help. This by far, and this is not organic, this by far is the best, best one we got for that right there. So you got to make sure that you use good disease resistant varieties and that is the main thing right there is make sure you get one that you can grow. Uh, <clears throat> now the next one we're going to talk about is powdery mildew and that's old Downey's first cousin. <laughs> and we're going to throw, show up a picture right here what Downey, excuse me, powdery mildew looks like. Powdery mildew just like the name implies has this white powdery look on the leaves. It's not near as problematic as Downey is but we do see it from time to time. We see it a lot of time on roses. You ever seen this little white fuzzy mm -hmm. stuff on your rose leaves? That's powdery mildew. It's caused by some of the same things that downy is caused by, but it's easier to control than the, uh, the downy is. Same thing, good uh, disease resistant varieties and also use drip irrigation. So the one thing with both of these mildews, powdery and downy is, they're caused by leaf wetness. They're what we consider water spores. Now, water spore means that it's moved by moisture. So therefore, if you can control that moisture as much as possible, you can control the disease. Drip irrigation. If you're having to do overhead irrigation, you either want to do it in the middle of the night or early in the morning or late in the afternoon. What you don't want to do is water at nine o'clock in the morning when that dew level has not dried off or either extend that dew level late in the afternoon. You could get by with overhead water in the middle of the day, but therefore we lose a lot of our water to evaporation then. So believe it or not, you're better off to get off, get up in the middle of the night and water your garden there if you're doing overhead irrigation. So drip tape, Planting those plants far enough apart so that you got a good air movement in there will also help. That's a good strategy right there. And that will help a lot with powdery mildew and downy mildew. So remember the mildews as we talk, I mean, as you think about growing your squashes, cucur uh, cucumbers, and those dreaded pumpkins. Watermelon. And watermelons. Watermelons get it too. Not as bad. I know we don't have as much problem with my watermelons. Of course, we grow ours on drill, but I don't have as much problem cucumbers. with that. You had some on your cucumbers. I had a little bit on my cucumbers earlier. Now, if you do fertilize them well, sometimes you can grow your way through it a little bit. But uh, we had some cloudy, overcast yeah. days, and I got hit a little hard with it. But I think they pulled through it, though. Pulled through it somewhat. I'm still struggling just a little bit. So winter squash is one of the, is, is a problem. It's just like pumpkins. We can have a hard time growing them in the fall. I do, I try it about every other year, but we have a hard time. We'll get about a half a harvest there. Mm. Yeah, Fungamax works on powdery mildew as well. All right, so let's move on to another disease. And this is called the dreaded tomated spotted wilt virus. Now for you guys up north, y'all may not face this problem near as much as we do in the south, but here in the deep south, this is a troublesome one for us. If we did not have spotted tomato virus resistant varieties, you probably wouldn't see very many tomatoes in the supermarket because just about all the commercial grown varieties are resistant tomato spotted with virus. Well, tomato spotted with virus can, more, can affect more than just Tomatoes. What about tobacco? What about beans? What about eggplants and peppers? We see it a lot of times in peppers, and most people don't know it, but it affects peppers a lot. And of course, tomatoes. Now, everybody's got their their problems, and that's the one we just noticed there is my problem, the virus. Really? Mm -hmm. You got it. I've got it. Mm -hmm. So why, in in medical Viruses, can they treat, I'm talking about human beings, can they treat viruses with antibiotics? No. Why not? Because it's a virus. It's not antibiotics bacterial. Just doesn't work on, does it? Mm -hmm. Neither do any of these. So any of these pest control products we got will not work against viruses. Now, tomato spotted with viruses primarily spread by an insect called thrip. Thrips are mobile. They fly in. They pierce your plant and we consider them vectors, they spread that disease. From a home gardener standpoint, it's nearly impossible to control thrips. 
Mm. Now the commercial guys do it because they use some chemicals that's not at our disposal, nor do we want them at our disposal. But they control those thrip levels so they can control the amount of spread they have of the tomato spotable virus. That coupled with the fact they use resistant varieties allows the farmers in our neck of the woods in Florida to actually make crops. So is your tomatoes aren't resistant against that? I planted some that are not, and you planted some that are not. But mine are okay. But you did okay, and that's the weird thing. And I got some that's okay, but I got a couple, I got two plants out of all of my tomatoes that have tomatoes spotted with virus. Now I did have, I did have two plants that I, I don't know, they kind of wilted. Did you pull them up? I did pull mm -hmm. them up, yeah, yeah early was, on. That was tomato spotted with virus. All right, you see how this plant yeah. right here is withered down? Folks, this right here is tomato spotted with virus. I got two plants out there that I know is not resistant to it. Will it spread to the other plants? It will. So it you can. need to get rid of it? I need to get rid of it. Yep. So I've got it there. That's the only two plants I've lost for, and I got a good many tomato plants here. But I know these two varieties are not resistant right there. I have other varieties growing out there that are not as resistant as well that are doing fine as of right now. Here's the thing about this virus. It can happen overnight, and it just yeah. wilts down as the name uh, implies there. Does There's it nothing. stay in the soil from year to year? No, I don't think it stays in the soil from year to year, but it's always good practice to do a, a lengthy yeah. rotation. You know, in my raised beds, I've never grown tomatoes down there. Really? Yeah, never have. I didn't know that. I, maybe four or five years ago, I had some cherry tomatoes, but not any. That might be one reason you're doing so good with those right there. Mm -hmm. But that virus is spread by the insects, primarily by the insects. So when we have an influx of thrips in there that you and I can't control, then we're going to have this problem right here. Now, it will also affect tobacco, folks. My first year growing tobacco, and I've lost about four plants to tomato spotted virus. And that's what you're looking at right there. It's the same thing. It looks a little different on tomatoes, and it's going to look a little different on peppers. But this plant here will not recover. The best thing to do is take it out. It just keeps going bad. And other plants that are infected will show signs within 24 hours, and they'll just continue to go by. Hopefully I won't lose but a couple of them. Last year I probably lost 25% of my garden, of my tomato crop, to tomato spotted with virus. But I knew I had three varieties in there that were not resistant. Mm -hmm. And I was trialing them against some that were resistant. And uh, I lost a good many there last year. Thankfully I ain't lost that many this year. So peppers, if you've ever had peppers just go down immediately, more likely it was a virus. So there you have it there. It's not a whole lot you can do about that, but, but you really can do research and grow those resistant varieties. Now that being said, there's been a lot of headway made on developing resistant varieties to make the spotted with virus. We expect to have some of our best selling varieties next year with the made the spotted with virus that don't have them this year. So I'm excited about that. And let's move on to a couple more. Let me Get my notes out right here, get my thoughts together. Mm -hmm. So here's what we're going to go into on these all these other diseases. And I'm going to group about six or seven of them together because the reality is some of them are very hard to tell the difference is We get emails sometimes with pictures, people send in, what's wrong with my plant? I said, well, it's a disease. A lot of times it's hard for me to identify a disease from a picture. You have to put them underneath a microscope or look at them real close to tell what the actual disease is. But the reality is you treat them pretty much all the same, so it don't really matter a whole lot. So for you guys that are suffering or have suffered from some of these right here, we're gonna talk about these and what to do about them. Late blight, early blight, we, talk, we think about tomatoes a lot when we think about that, but they can also affect potatoes. They're getting eggplants, peppers, things like that. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Not so much okra. No, okra, we have similar problems, but not, not so much that. Leaf spot, gray leaf spot, bacteria spot, and alternaria. We've got pictures of each one of them right there we're going to throw up on the screen there. And as you look at each one of these right here, you'll notice there's subtle differences in each one of them, but not profound differences in either one of them. 
So the best thing to do when you think about these diseases without getting into being a disease expert is understand the control is pretty much the same or off of them. I had this conversation the other day about worms. Somebody was wanting to identify a worm. Mm -hmm. I said, you kill all worms the same way. So if you want to get caught up and call it a cabbage loop or an army worm and all that, that's fine. A but you, a, worm. a worm is a worm. You kill the worm the same way. So on all these problems, and blight's probably been the worst one. We do see a lot of bacteria uh, speck or bacteria spot up in North Carolina and the, the northern states. We don't see as much of it down here. Um, we see a lot of leaf spot and we see a lot of blight. We have problems with early blight more than we do late blight. Some people are just the opposite there. But don't get caught up in trying to identify these too much because it's not that important. All right. So one of the things you can do is to make sure that your plants are not starving. So if you got a good, healthy plant and it's fertilized and it's fed well, it's more apt to overcome being sick. But same thing. Same here. thing. Yeah. Don't if you're stressed, high level anxiety, um, you're gonna get sick. Same thing with plants. So make sure they're watered well. Make sure they fed well. Eat healthy. Yep. Next thing is, as we talked about this earlier with other things, remove those unwanted weeds so that you don't have host plants around that can spread these diseases out. And rotation. How important is rotation? We yeah. see them just right here, how important it is. And us with small gardens, we have a problem with that. I have a problem with it as well because I just have limited space on what we can move around. Imagine if you just got four raised beds. Yeah. You know, you're really limited on what you can do there. Rotation is extremely important. Then we have these fungicides here on these leaf spots and these blights that we can apply as a preventive. I don't like using them as a curative because they just don't work as well. They work really good preventative. Um, and we talked about drip before. Drip is also important on these, for example, early blight. If you got drip tape and you're watering in that soil, you're not splashing up from that soil on those leaves like you would with overhead irrigation. So good, not planting your rows too close, keeping good airflow, keeping that irrigation down there on the roots and not on the leaves is definitely going to help. And then we have these right here. That one is pretty much the most broad spectrum when we have that one pretty much for everything. There again, it's got a simple mode of action. Imagine just putting a film all over your plant to protect it, like sunscreen. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much what this sunscreen product right here does. Old chemistry right here that's been used a lot over the years. And then we got liquid cop that probably has more activity on bacteria spot than any of the rest of them. Works good on all of them. And we have garden fossil, which is my favorite one as well. Garden fossil is a good round spectrum. Now here's the best thing, is to rotate these because they have different modes of action. And then we have the Monterey Complete Disease Control, which has a different mode of action. This is a beneficial bacteria here that's got, works different. You can also use this as a drench for water spores. So that's a good one right there. But use all them in different ways as preventative, not necessarily curative. I think you'll be you'll be satisfied. Use some out in the water and the splashback. One thing I did do with these is I put straw down up under them as a mulch. Um, who was that on the show? Donnie Glover. Donnie Glover. He was on one of our uh, live shows, and he talked about how important it was to cover that soil so it doesn't get splashed. And I think, and then I've also kept the bottom trimmed so there's nothing, you know, at the bottom. I think Donnie brought up a good point, and that is a great point. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do next year. I'm going to use our Lazy Garden kit next year to grow my tomatoes on kind of that. Mm -hmm. So it has that fabric there, so you can't splash that disease up on there. Mm -hmm. But any kind of mulch will work. I, I'm not a fan of wood chips. Wheat straw, pine straw, any of that will definitely help. It's hard to do in bigger gardens, yeah. but uh, it definitely helps. I think so. And there again, plant disease resistant varieties. There are varieties out there that are more resistant to blight than others. Uh, so use those varieties to make it's them work for you. It is fun to have other stuff in your it garden. It is fun, and I grow some every year. I got them growing out there in my garden. You're just going to pay the price. Yeah, you said I would never grow these. I said you would never grow these because these come a breeder out of California. 
And I'm always skeptical of free, uh, varieties that come out of California because they don't select, they don't have the same disease pressure that we do in the eastern United States. I would rather see a trial down in Florida than I had the California to see a variety come out of it because I know it's going to work better in our area. However, <laughs> I've been wrong on this one. <laughs> and from this same breeder, I got a cherry tomato growing in my garden called Indigo Blueberries that oh, has yeah. done extremely well. So this guy right here has done some wonderful work. He's got lots of varieties he's worked on out there. And the ones we've tried so far have done well for us. Mm -hmm. And one thing about them, they got really good vigor. Mm -hmm. They grow, I mean, this. I have like a tomato jungle down there. I know, there. it's crazy. It's just unreal. I'm going to have to do a garden tour of my tomato jungle. So with all these things that we've talked about, we've talked about peppers and we've talked about cucumbers and we got some more coming too. But one of the main things that we've done with our Halsinator series of cucumbers and peppers and tomatoes, and hopefully we got some other varieties or other things coming out later on, is extreme well-rounded disease resistant plants. That's one thing we strive for with the Halsinator series. Those are beautiful, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Look at that jalapeno. Yep. And we've ate these several different ways. Mm -hmm. And you not liking really hot stuff. This is really excellent. That bell pepper. Yeah. So I got another bell pepper grew right beside the hostinator, and the hostinator's outperformed that other bell pepper dramatically. And I didn't necessarily want it to, but it has. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about thrips a while ago. Sometimes certain varieties of bell peppers are have more thrip pressure than others. That Hossinator, Poblano, Jalapeno, and Bell holds up extremely well in the southeastern United States, and we're proud of those. Mm -hmm. And bananas. Bananas, not Hossinator series, but that is the Gold Rush, which is one of my yeah. favorites here. That is a great one. All right, so there you have it, folks. Don't be intimidated by disease control. Try to understand it somewhat and try to understand what you can do. And look here. We all have disease problems, so just don't feel like you're the only one that's going to have this right here. I can't think of a year I don't have some kind of disease pressure and I lose a few plants. I try to plan ahead and plant a few extra ones. It just happens. All right. Sounds good. How about the garden spotlight? The garden spotlight. The garden spotlight this week is Tony Key. Tony Key? Yeah. Do you know Tony Key? I don't know Tony. Um, Monticello, Georgia. Yeah. He's on nine. So he's a little bit ahead of us. And oh, it looks like his garden is like right behind his house. It is. And he grows tomatoes, patty pans, spaghetti squash, eggplant. And it's on his back patio. But look how much he can grow in a tomato. small space. Yep, he's got those little raised planters there on his patio. Just goes to show you folks, you don't have to have a lot of room to grow a lot of vegetables. That's he's preparing for those. He's got his little uh, arch over that, so he's preparing to have some big tomato plants there. And Tony's got a little powder mildew on it. Excuse me, <laughs> down the mildew on his cucurbits there, which is normal. He's got his fence growing. They got a nice trellis system there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you, Tony, for sending those in. And getting dirty. Yeah. If you want to send us your garden photos, um, there's a link under Hosh University on our website. So we got to do the old goat drawing. And let me be honest with you, I've not even looked at today. So the old goat's at. He's here. So the old goat is a figurine hidden on the set here somewhere. You find it, pick it out, put it in the comments below. We'll send you a nice prize. You know, last week we had it right up here, front yeah. and center, and there were so many people that couldn't find it because they kept looking on the shelf, and it was just so obvious. Yep. Who is the winner? James Wise. James, send us your information to CustomerServeHossTools.com, and we'll send you a wonderful gift here from the folks here at Hoss Tools. And we got to do the Monterey, Monterey, Monterey oh giveaway. All right, so let's move some of this out of the way. Do a little housekeeping there. The great folks at Monterey sponsor a giveaway every week for you guys. And how fitting could it be? Let's talk about disease control. Perfect. Let's see if we can 
All right, so there we have it, folks. The Monterey giveaway is these four products right here. We have the Complete Disease Control, which pretty much I don't know of anything you can't use that on. And you can use it in any weather. It won't burn. You got the horticulture oil here, which is a light horticulture oil that works great on those soft body insects. And this one won't burn either. You can spray it any time of the day. And you need a good natural fish guano fish fertilizer to uh, keep those plants nice and healthy. And we have the yellow sticky traps right there that you can use to trap those insects to see what your population levels is or to use them for control. And the winner last week is Jay Spoutwell. What was the question last week? You just asked where they were from, the city and state. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a lot of good responses there. A lot of responses. A lot of responses. So send us your uh, information to cut serve and we'll get it out as well. Get you this four product giveaway out to you. So the question is, what are we going to do this week for this giveaway right here? I was thinking what sh for them to comment what their biggest disease issue is. That's great because it's going to vary according to where you live. Yeah. Right? And how, how do you, what do you do to uh, battle it? Just put it, I tell you what, just put it in the comments below exactly what disease, and if you don't know, just say leaf spot, but pop in the comments below what disease that you have the most problem with. That'll help us mm -hmm. when we do these shows and stuff and plan out right there. And uh, maybe by next week I'll have a tomato. Uh, it's two weeks in a row you mm -hmm. had one. Oh, you had some little sun gold. Yeah, but I'm talking about a tomato, a tomato, a tomato, tomato. tomato yeah. Yeah, I think we have a tomato sandwich here. Sounds Isn't good to me. It's gorgeous. beautiful. Gorgeous, gorgeous. All right, folks. Glad y'all joined us. Hope you're having a good gardening year as well. And I hope you're going to have one of those good tomato sandwiches pretty soon yourself. Thank y'all. Now it's time for you to get outside and get dirty.